Okay. Thanks, everybody, for being here on a rainy uh, Monday morning. I think the fact that we have a full house, I think, speaks uh, to the fact that this is a very important and compelling topic. I want to uh, thank my friends at PricewaterhouseCoopers for helping us uh, pull this off and bringing such an interesting group together. So thank you, John Glover and, and company from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, the topic is the challenges and opportunities of urbanization. Uh, I think many of you know that we've, we've hit a landmark in the last year or so that more than 50% of the world live in cities. Uh, it's the first time in humankind that that's happened. It has all sorts of implications uh, for the future of development. It has all sorts of implications uh, for the future of growth. It has implications of infrastructure, energy, technology. I think we're going to be able to touch all of these topics today. We really have an excellent keynote uh, speaker to kick this off, Dr. Juan Clos who is the Undersecretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Human Settlements Program, better known as UN Habitat, is going to give a, present a keynote uh, presentation. I want to apologize to everybody in advance. This is the first time this has ever happened. We're having problems with our PowerPoint today, so we will be sending folks the, the two PowerPoint presentations afterwards via email. So it's my first time in my four years this has happened, so I want to apologize to you and to the to our speakers, we just had this happen in the last 30 minutes. So, um, and we can't blame uh, cyber attacks on this, though we have had some cyber attacks, but this isn't, this isn't a cyber attack related issue. But um, I, Dr. Juan Klaus is, 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 is as Sec Executive Director of UN Habitat, I think is really qualified to uh, help us frame this conversation. He's a former mayor of Barcelona, one of, the, one of the most beautiful cities in Spain and one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. Uh, and obviously is, uh, also was an ambassador, I think, in a, in a, as well. And so I think we're very, very fortunate to have um, such a distinguished person. He's in from Nairobi, Kenya, because the uh, UN Habitat is based in Nairobi, Kenya. He didn't fly in all the way uh, to be with us solely, but it's uh, really a, a distinct honor to have um, uh, Dr. Juan Kloss with us. So Dr. Kloss, why don't you come up and, um, and please make some remarks. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Dan, uh, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to address this uh, uh, audience uh, here in, in the uh, CSIS uh, and talk about a, a very important topic that now is happening around the world, which is this process of accelerated uh, urbanization. As you know, uh, UN Habitat is the UN uh, agency which is specialized in uh, uh, urbanization. We are supposed to be the planetary uh, observatory of uh, what is happening in ur urbanization around the world. And we try to study urbanization in its uh, strategic uh, evolution and see a little bit how are the keys and, and, and what, what are the most interesting things that are happening in, in urbanization. As Dan has said, uh, in, in really three or four years ago already, uh, the world urban population reached uh, 50%. Uh, by now, uh, we are already convinced that the figure is 35, uh, 55%, uh, because the process of urbanization, it's really not just uh, very big in terms of absolute numbers, it's also uh, important for its uh, acceleration. Uh, urbanization is accelerating. Uh, we have studied, as I said, urbanization, and it's very interesting, for example, uh, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, the process of urbanization took, uh, used to took place in societies around when societies reached something like between two and three thousand dollars per capita. When, when that happened, it, it was the, the moment that the, the societies be, be used to begin the process of urbanization. But now at the beginning of the 21th century, something very new has, is happening, and is that uh, urbanization is taking uh, place between 500 and $1,000 per capita. And that means that uh, we are seeing uh, uh, urbanization where before it was uh, not expected yet. Huh? Uh, and this is the case now, perhaps, perhaps the most interesting case is, is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's a real boom of, uh, of uh, urbanization. Uh, well, the figures are astonishing in, in absolute numbers. Uh, 
if we are now 3.7 billion of people urbanized uh, in the coming 20, 30, 50 years, it doesn't really matter, uh, we are going to double this figure. And, and this is a huge planetary change. The, 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 the question of the equilibrium of the planet uh, is going to change in a very important manner because when people uh, urbanize, uh, a lot of things happen. It's not just that people go to the cities. Uh, when people live in cities, they change their mind, they change their attitudes, they do different things, and uh, th that affects the uh, equilibrium uh, and the status quo of the society. There are many changes which are economic. Uh, uh, for example, one of the things that uh, when, when a, rural, a rural person moves to an urban setting, usually tends to multiply the consumption of energy by 10. This is the average uh, increase of energy consumption. Hmm? But, uh, and there are other questions also. When people move to the cities, and they are less under the, um, let's say, the, the psychological influence of the family and of the, and of the uh, tribe or whatever, you, or, or local, local culture, and they move to a big city, uh, they, they change their social habits and their political habits also. Uh, and this is very important because uh, people in cities tend to be more uh, demanding and that in rural areas and they they tend to make more noise uh, and this is something that uh, the Arab Spring has shown in a very clear uh, manner then I just want to explain this this um, energetic or political and economic uh, changes because uh, urbanization although it's very important because with the reports of the World Bank and, uh, and uh, specialized companies, uh, they always tend to say, okay, there's going to be a need of three billion uh, dollars in, in uh, basic services, drainage, transportation. Yeah, all that is true. But taking into account that urbanization, apart from the economic side, about from the financial side, has much other important uh, uh, implications some of them, they are not economic, and can, they can be very, very important. And they can introduce a lot of uh, changes in, in many parts of the, of the world. Uh, we, we uh, as experts of urbanization, we are used to the classic process of urbanization. For us, the classic process of urbanization is the one which follows the line, which, uh, which are, in that sense, normal in, in a kind of a statistical uh, manner. And that means that, for example, we usually have poor societies which are mainly based on agriculture uh, and the rest of the primary sector, let's say mining or fishing and all these things, uh, the primary sector of the economy. Uh, the, the, the economies which are based, based on the primary sector of the economy, they tend to have an rates of urbanization between 20%, 25%. And then uh, it reaches a point where these uh, societies, if, if they improve their economy, usually because of improved uh, agrarian productivity, they begin to uh, change and the rate of urbanization begins to increase. Uh, and then is the moment when from 20 they move to 30, 35. This is the case, for example, uh, of India in this moment. Uh, and many other, um, perhaps a little bit more advanced, Malaysia, Indonesia, and, and very big countries in the rest of the world which are uh, uh, urbanizing uh, very fast. In this phase of, of uh, second phase of urbanization, uh, we see the beginning of uh, the construction sector, buildings, and then the beginning of the most basic uh, industrialization. Uh, construction and industrialization change the labor market, and, and the city provides the good scenario 
for, uh, for uh, the, the generation of new wealth related to these new uh, economical sectors, mainly the construction um, business and then the industrialization and uh, the first phases of industrialization, usually they are the textile industry, uh, garments and all that. And this is what we are seeing now in India, we are seeing that in uh, Bangladesh, in Pakistan, and uh, in many parts of the world, where they are already in the uh, beginning of the process of industrialization, uh, and that it's uh, accelerating the, the first phase of acceleration of uh, the economy. But uh, this classic um, process of industrialization, we have seen it in the most important organizations in human history, and I am not referring to the old times or the Neolithic or these kind of things, or the Romans or the Greeks, and etc. I am referring to just after the Second World War, for example, the first huge process of uh, urbanization was what? Japan. Japan was the real uh, agrarian society, nearly feudal society, that uh, after the political change introduced by the uh, losing uh, the Second World War uh, and under the um, uh, uh, West influence in, in its economy, they began a huge process of urbanization which went together with industrialization. Apart from Japan, the second biggest process of urbanization in Asia was Korea, perfect. And uh, well, then, uh, etc. And now we have seen the biggest one, which has been China. China has urbanized 400 million people in 20 years, and it's a kind of mm, massive never seen in human history. Uh, the interesting thing, though, of all these processes in Asia is that they have been driven by uh, industrialization. Uh, Industrialization and urbanization has gone in parallel. I am, I am placing some attention here because now we are facing a new revolution that is the first time that we see in a massive scale in human history. And is that we are seeing a huge process of urbanization without industrialization. And this is South Africa, Africa sorry, Sub-Saharan Africa. We are seeing a huge process of urbanization without industrialization. And in a way, there's a, a, typic, a typic kind of, uh, 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 of urbanization. And uh, we are wondering what is uh, moving people from the rural areas to the urban areas uh, in Africa. Because uh, it's not jobs. At least it's not formal jobs. Because in Africa city, there's no formal jobs. There's a lot of informal jobs including mafias, uh, uh, you, know, uh, the, uh, fun, uh, you know, slums, whatever, uh, but not formal jobs. And uh, we are coming to the conclusion that the, what is driving the, the urbanization of Africa uh, is the, it's the improved uh, productivity of the uh, agrarian economy. It's not a, a, a pull factor, is a push factor. People is, is moved out of the uh, rural areas because the rural, the agrarian production is increasing very fast and, and uh, they are not needed there anymore. And, and that is pushing. This is not the first time that that happened because uh, that happened also in, in, in uh, the 17th century in, in the UK before the Industrial Revolution when it was some reforms in the agrarian law, the, the enclosures uh, legislation, which opened up the productivity of the agrarian uh, areas of, uh, of England mainly, and that produced huge migration towards, uh, towards London. And in fact, the Dickensonian uh, London, it's an expression which was full of slums, by the way, it's an expression of this uh, urbanization driven not by industrialization, but by improved productivity in the agrarian regions. 
This is very important because uh, that, that, that presents a, a, politic, di, a political dilemma because in, in, in Africa, there's a people who, who tends to say, okay, okay, uh, we cannot manage uh, urbanization, then we should retain the people in the, in the agrarian uh, areas, eh, the, in the rural areas. But uh, the question is that they cannot be retained there because as the agrarian productivity is increased, uh, they need to, uh, they are pushed out. And then uh, the problem is that, uh, for example, for the first time in history, the African nations, they are confronted with the harsh reality that they need to do something with urbanization. They cannot just say, oh, let's see how it solves itself. It's not going to solve itself. Uh, then, uh, uh, just to finish uh, my, my presentation, I, I will say, as, as in this capacity of World Observatory, that uh, we are extremely worried about the model of urbanization that we are seeing around the world. Uh, and this is the second part of my presentation. It's not related with the first, just more, a little bit uh, connected, but not too much. We are, we are seeing what is the kind of urbanization that we are building, uh, even we study that by satellites and all that. And uh, the kind of urbanization that is being built, by the way, all the urbanization that is being built is in the developing world. 98.9% of the urbanization is taking place uh, in, in the developing world. Uh, and all of the doubling of the urban population that is going to take place in the next 40, 50 years is going to happen in the developing world then uh, don't worry in the developed world. We are not going to, to, to be part of this huge revolution that is going to happen in the human uh, uh, species. Uh, this is going to happen in the developed world. Uh, here in the developed world, uh, we only will see small changes, but not really uh, very important. Now the, the, the things are happening in the developing world because there is where the urbanization is very low, and there is where the urbanization will reach, as everywhere else in the world, about 80% in this period of time. And then uh, the problem is that the developing world is urbanizing under a model which is a copy uh, of our mo typical model of urbanization of the 70s is not even uh, 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 the current day urbanization that is becoming more and more prevalent in the West. They are still on, uh, uh, imitating um, the, the urbanization of the 70s, and this is uh, especially worrisome because uh, the urbanization of the 70s in, in the developed world uh, has been uh, checked and studied in many ma manners, and it, it presents quite a number of problems, at least two of them, very important. One, it's economic problem. Uh, the, the, the urbanization of the 70s, uh, it's an urbanization which is based on the master planning methodology, which tends to make use in an excessive manner of the uh, catalogation of the uses of land. One of the, defi the defining principles of the planning, uh, of modern master planning, is the catalogation of land. This land is uh, uh, industrial, this land is residential, this land is commercial, this land is recreational, this land is for a mall, this land is for that and that and that. This uh, catalogation of land. Uh, which was invented uh, in the first third of the 20th century, uh, uh, now with the, could, could have been of use in the industrial uh, society, but is not of use in the post-industrial society. Because this uh, methodology of planning generates a huge demand of mobility. A normal person needs to go during the day to two or three different parts of the city in a kind of uh, endless um, mobility demand. And uh, this, is, this is one of the problems. 
which then, as we use mainly fossil fuels and uh, we, we generate a lot of energy consumption and the energy that we use uh, is still fossil fuels, if we can find the clean energy, all that will be uh, solved. But while we don't find an alternative energy, this is a real problem for ecological issues. But this is not the worst aspect of uh, the, the zone uh, uh, master planning. The worst aspect is the weakening of the economies of agglomeration. Economies of agglomeration were very well described by geographic economy and relates to the fact that the urban setting uh, increases the productivity of the economy due to the proximity of the factors of production and to the uh, diminished cost of transaction, uh, you have in, in the urban environment a higher productivity rate. That means that you can get more outputs with less inputs. And this is one of the miracles of urbanization. It's a uh, uh, wealth engine. It's a wealth generating machine. But in order to be a wealth generating machine, the good productive city needs to allow for the economies of agglomeration. And if the city is not designed for the economies of agglomeration, we lose one of the most important factors of, uh, and one of the, of the most uh, positive factors uh, of urbanization. And the problem is that the zoning has been very good for the real estate business, but it has been, been very bad and very unproductive for the economies of agglomeration of the city, which is a kind of macroeconomic effect. You have real land values protected by zoning, which is a kind of microeconomic effect, but you lose the macroeconomic effect of the productivity of the city. And the second is much more important than the first, but like a m multiple of 10 times. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that uh, it's a kind of competition between, between two goods. Eh? Uh, the pretension of zoning and keeping the value of the land, because zoning what it's due for a real estate business uh, is that it protects very well. You, it, it, give, it gives you a very good direction of what is going to be the price of the land. And, and this is very good for the, for, the, for the real estate business. But it goes against the uh, economies of agglomeration. Uh, and as nobody uh, defends the economies of agglomeration, uh, what happens is that zoning tends to be extremely successful. And this is a problem that we are seeing in this uh, developing uh, world urbanization, that they are resorting to this kind of master planning as the, the typical form of urbanizing, and they are losing, or they are not losing, weakening their uh, possibilities of uh, economies of agglomeration. The cities that they are built, they are not especially productive. And we have seen that in a very big manner in China in China, which has urbanized so many people. If you look at the urban, uh, uh, principles of urbanization of China, uh, they are uh, uh, principles that, uh, although they are very effective for industrial economy, they will be not so effective, you will see that very soon, uh, in post-industrial uh, societies. Uh, uh, the other question, and with that I will finish, is that uh, mm, uh, a city, you can get a, a city which produces the uh, good outputs that uh, we are talking here, if you design it. You, you, the, 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 the urbanization either takes place spontaneously, without plan, uh, and then everybody occupies the land, which is the normal way in the, where there's no institutional capacity to put a direction to the process of urbanization, or you can plan. Uh, then the unplanned urbanization that we have studied, it's very inefficient because there's no enough public space, there's no connectivity, and then they lose most of the economies of urbanization. Then, uh, but this is the most prevalent manner of urbanization in the developing world, the unplanned urbanization. 
For example, a planet urbanization requires at least 30% of the land allocated to the street pattern, and at least the street pattern needs to have eight street junctions, uh, 80 street junctions uh, per square kilometer. When we go and then plan a city, instead of 30%, we used to have 8, 9, 10% of pay, uh, space allocated to the street, and the number of crossings per square kilometers go down to 20. And then without crossings or junctions and without the street, you will not be surprised that mega capitals in the south, even with no much cars per inhabitants, they became collapsed and you need to three hours to go everywhere. And this is because there's no the most basic principles of planning. Then, if we move to the planet wall, I always say that, well, the fact that you plan is not enough in order to get uh, the results, expected good results of uh, the good city you need to plan well, because you can plan badly. And if you plan badly, you lose also everything. Then uh, uh, this is a problem because in general, the plans that are in place usually tend to be bad urban planning. They tend to be not very well oriented to the, uh, to the objective of generating wealth, okay? With that, I will uh, finish, and I think that we will have the opportunity to have a dialogue and a conversation, and, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps we can uh, introduce further uh, uh, insight to this uh, interesting process of wall urbanization, which is taking place now in the world. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Dr. Close. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a very nice way to kickstart this conversation. We really appreciate Dr. Close being here. I'm going to ask the panelists to come up. And then as part of my urban planning, when the panelists come up, I'll ask some of the folks who are standing, they can come sit up front here. So please, panelists, take a seat up, up here on the dais. And that way, we can relieve some of, the, uh, some of the urban pressure, some of the population pressure back there at the back of the room. So, uh, And feel free to sit next to folks and get to know each other, shake hands and say hi. It's OK. There, there's, a spare, there's also a seat up over here as well. So good. OK. There's still a couple more seats here and here if people want to take them. Don't be shy. Good. OK, we've really got a great panel um, to cover this, this to, to take the conversation further. Uh, we have uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Hazem Galal, who's a partner for the state and local government sector. He's a state and local government sector global leader. He's also been the lead on uh, the cities of opportunity work that PricewaterhouseCoopers does, as well as uh, a major report they recently did called Investor Ready Cities. So we really appreciate you being here. Hazem, I'll just go through just through the panels and then I'll turn it over to you. And then we also have uh, Rick Abelson, who's based in LA, and he's the global director of master planning facilities and urban environments at CH2M Hill. And he's a recognized leader in creating culturally significant land planning developments worldwide. We then have Robin King, who is with us from uh, WRI, and she runs something called Embark, but is also part of a, large, a larger new initiative at WRI on uh, urban development that I think you'll hear a little bit about later. Thank you for being with us, Robin. Then we also have um, Abbas Ja, who's a practice manager in urban and disaster risk management for East Asia and the Pacific with the World Bank. And then we have my very good friend, uh, Charles North, who's a, a senior deputy assistant administrator uh, at USAID and a foreign service officer. So I think we've got the right mix of folks for this discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Hazem Galal. Thanks for being with us, Hazem. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, I'd like to kick off basically where uh, Dr. Claus left off in terms of when we think about where really urbanization is accelerating the most, it is in developing countries. And some places like Latin America, it's been at 80 or 90% for many years now. So this is not really new. And a lot of the 
you know, issues that come with that because it has happened without the economic activities and the generation of jobs and the proper planning have resulted, uh, I was surprised they actually called them slums, Inform informal settlements, but AKA known as slums, have been not only a phenomenon in Latin America, but are starting even to find their way into different parts of the world. So it is in this context that we've been looking at really how can we reverse the tide and if urbanization is a fact, it's a mega trend, what is it that cities and regions can do around the world to deal with some of these issues, to become more competitive and to be able to think about things in a different way that would allow them to face the challenges. Um, so we've done several pieces of research. One of them, actually, we called it um, urban competitiveness uh, with Eurocur from the University of uh, Am uh, Erasmus in Rotterdam. And it was primarily around looking at what we called transformational projects. These are projects that had allowed regions or cities to really change their developmental course. And from the observations and what we've seen there is uh, what we call the five C's, basically. We start with the first one, which is the context. Um, oftentimes, you see a lot of cities or regions thinking about you know, becoming knowledge-based economies. But what they fail to do sometimes is really understand what are their comparative and competitive advantages in terms of the type of skills they have, in terms of the resources they have. So, so many times around the world, I would see cities that all of them want to become biotechnology hubs. Uh, all of them want to be, you know, sort of like education clusters, and not everybody is going to succeed. So the ability to understand your context becomes very important when you're trying to become uh, more competitive. The second C would be about the capabilities. What is it that you need actually to to build in terms of the city management? Uh, the capabilities that you need to have in place so that you're able to execute on, on those uh, ambitious visions. I mean, um, again, uh, Mayor Klaus, I'll call you this time, Barcelona has been touted as an example of a great transformational project that changed how we thought about uh, mega events, mega sporting events, and, and it continues to evolve because, you know, the first transformation happened and the city kept uh, reinventing itself. So how do you take this ability to build capabilities and leadership within the city itself, the city management, that would drive that kind of tr transformation? And here I would like to link it to the whole um, requirement of being able to fund some of these projects. Um, we did a survey about three or four years ago, and there were about 120 cities. And two-thirds, 67 percent, mentioned access to finance and the ability of financial capabilities as the main challenge that would allow them to implement on their visions. And is at the same time, when you ask the same cities, and we're not talking about cities in least developed countries or emerging economies, we're talking about also developed uh, cities. Um, only 25% of them said that they feel they have internally the capabilities that would allow them to um, form public-private partnerships, to think about creative ways, to fund their infrastructure and projects. And of course, when you think about least developed uh, countries, in that case, access to multilateral and donor money. The, set, the third C I'd like to talk about, it's about choices, in terms of how do you actually approach your development, you know, and the, and the trade-offs you have to make between radical versus, um, you know, uh, paradigm change or, or incremental transition. And many times we are challenged here with the election cycles. I mean, many cities have mayors that are there for three to five years, and a lot of really the transformational projects that you need to implement wouldn't pay off in terms of votes and all of that within that time horizon. So how can you start really addressing this inherent change between the incentives of some of the city managers and politicians that make those allocations and the real needs of the society and the economy. Uh, it becomes very interesting also when you think about it in some of the new type of projects that we're thinking about, uh, you know, in terms of smart cities, in terms of those really capital intensive investments that their benefits and business cases are not always very evident. 
Um, the fourth one is about the competencies, you know, in terms of the ability also to bring in the right competencies from your own region and from the surrounding region and to, to work together on taking these competencies and challenging them in terms of a talent pool. One of the things that were very interesting we worked with Singapore on was to answer the question, if you're not going to be able to continue to grow economically with your organic uh, population growth, growth rate, how do you actually fill in that gap so that you continue to grow in a sustainable way, but using imported talent, if you will? And in many situations, when you think about what's gonna happen in the developed world with the demographic uh, changes there and an aging society, if some of these cities and countries were to continue to become sustainably economically, that talent gap has to be bridged somehow. It's either gonna be through technology, but also by attracting talent. And the US has been very good actually in attracting the best students in the world and keeping them here. Other countries are looking at how to replicate that. The um, final C is about, and the most important one I would say is about collaboration. It is how you get all the different stakeholders, academia, the private sector, the NGOs, the different levels of, of government. I mean, Rio de Janeiro, where I've lived for many years, had a terrible security problem that was unsolvable. There were no-go parts that the drug dealers controlled completely. And it only took three things to happen to start getting this problem under control. The alignment between the federal and the state and the city government in terms of political parties, that happened for the first time. Uh, a stimulus event, the World Cup, if you look at Maracanã, the famous stadium, it was actually surrounded by no-go zones that were all taken by the drug dealers. So it was not going to be, the country was not gonna able to host such a mega event under these circumstances. And the third one was the leadership. You know, they had a person who thought in a unique way, and what used to happen, they would go in into these mostly slums, fight the traffic dealers, and then pull out. And that what they started doing is to have more permanent police presence, security, followed by services, because it's all about jobs, it's all about access to services that would help either transform the young youth into become more uh, of productive citizens or as compared to being parts of that uh, economy. So these are some of the components, if you will, that we would like to think about as we're thinking about urbanization and how we can not only think about it in different ways, but think about it as you know, a way of creating more density, of creating more economic activities, and sometimes thinking even about the unit of planning. You, you mentioned land use being the main unit of planning. I would argue also, for the longest time, we've been basing our planning around the cars, you know, as the unit rather than the human being and their activities and how they actually move around the city. And cars are like cigarettes, I would say. You know, we're, we know they're bad for us, but we're addicted to them, or at least some, some people are, at least not myself. So we need to think about a new paradigm of planning these new cities, or actually regenerating and working on some of the retrofit of the existing cities, which is always a much um, more difficult task. I'll pause here in the interest of time, and then we can continue afterwards with the comments. Thank you, Hazem. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Abelson, please, the floor is yours. Speaking about. Um, so we're talking about the challenges and opportunities of urbanization. Thank you. Um, so uh, having started early in my career, actually working with Victor Gruen, who invented the regional shopping center and, and developing freeways and cities, uh, I have an appreciation for that. And um, my role actually uh, in evolving cities is to get in and get my hands dirty. I'm trying to figure out day to day, how do you get this stuff done? I'm the guy that shows up with the markers and the pens and tries to build the vision and sell it through and, and, and you know, kind of continue that whole um, uh, grand theory across if we can get it done. And, you know, right now, I think ultimately what we're seeing in both developing and cities as, as well as uh, emerging cities is that we're all trying to do what are the commonalities. We're all trying to kind of redefine the urban areas by reducing their inefficiencies and lowering their costs. That's really one of the goals that everybody's trying to do. But as 
I've been thinking as a result of all that, what, what happens? If, if we could get rid of all the inefficiencies and we could lower all the costs and everybody got to what they wanted in the city, what would happen? And I think that the benefit out of that would be that everyone would get more time. And that's the critical word, that you would have more time. And um, what it means is that then you can start to live the life that you want, that you can start to play with your children more, that you could take art classes, uh, that you don't have to drive the car as much. And if that's the goal, that's the goal that I want to work towards. So um, that also, I think, becomes the, even the definition for sustainability. So this notion of creating or manufacturing time is, I think, what the ultimate great city would look like, that people could actually live the life that they want. Um, so how do you get there? Um, there's really three components that I've been seeing about how we're developing um, these cities. We have the city itself, the entity, the government, on one hand, um, that really is asking the question, how do you do this? We see all these new papers, we've traveled all these places, these government officials, we want to do it ourselves, we just don't know how. And you, as, say, in our case, CH2M Hill or others, you are integrators. That's the second piece. You're an integrator that can help us bridge to these products and services that are available today to help the city become what it needs to become. So tell us how, since we don't really understand, but we know what we're trying to get to as a vision, and all these great things that people come to us from Cisco and IBM and Apple and Microsoft, how do we get all that together? And there's a, there's a piece in the middle, which is the, the integrator, and that's the role where planning will come in. That's where um, you know, all the PWCs come in, all my collaborators here, where we have to work together to do that. And if we talk about opportunities and challenges, is, there is, there is a, there's a fatal flaw right there that we're continuing to work on, and that is that uh, just the way capitalism works today, we see all these great products and services, but they don't all work together. So all these products and services to change the world, give us all this time, manufacture everything that we want and live the life we want are available today. The, the key is how do you put them together and how do you get them to work together in a meaningful way? Um, that goes into realms with technology and open source. We have lots of uh, products that are proprietary software, companies that don't actually want to work together but say that they do. So this is, this is a challenge, and it, and it comes up fundamentally when we start to create some of those basic foundations and principles that we want to do uh, to create the brand or the brand image for a city, which is the third thing I want to just quickly talk about, that when we create these authentic brands for cities, um, in, in, the way that I try to solve these is I'll go to a city around the world and I'll try to take the two most compelling problems in the city. I don't try to solve the whole thing. If we go to uh, uh, countries, let's say like Rio, like you were mentioning, what are the two hot buttons that really need to be solved there that strike the mayor's chord, that really are the ones that really would change society? So in Rio's case, the notion of security, uh, personal security, and transportation. Those are two. Uh, in another city, it might be completely different. It might be about water and public health. So we can't just go around and say, you know, all these cities are the same. But if by taking these two fundamental issues, um, I try to apply what we call complexity theory on that. I try to find the inefficiency in one and squeeze out the revenue sources however we can, and that, that's a lot of painful work, and then use the money to help fund the other. So if I could get inefficiency out of um, um, energy costs for a homeowner, or for uh, city buildings or blocks, I could take that savings and apply it to a community-based healthcare program. And that, that's how I bring the products and services together to make change. And there are, and we can talk later about examples of how that's done. Uh, so fundamentally, that's how those little wins are gonna be able to create the change and then they kind of, they expand and they multiply. So by creating that brand energy, um, and then attracting the right investment partners and development strategies. You've got the basics in place. Then we're able to apply the creative funding, I'm, I'm sorry, the creative planning and design that you were talking about. We're able to integrate the right products and services. We're able to put the flexible kind of technologies and implementation plans together. We need operations and management, which is critical to help these cities run these projects once that they're up. And we need public awareness campaigns to continue on to keep educating the public. This is well done in Singapore on water about um, the benefits of what they're getting from this. So the last uh, 
quick thing uh, are just kind of the opportunistic trends that I see right now happening in the world uh, related to um, uh, urbanization. One is sustainability is still a key word, but we're starting to apply the word self-sufficiency. The notion that the people want to be able to survive on their own, that goes to the resiliency issue, but not, as, not only is it about sustainability, but we want to be self-sufficient. Like we want to be able to hold ourselves up against our own. We don't want to have people having to leave our city because of a result and have to go to another city, as New Orleans to Houston happened. Uh, the notion of diaspora as a funding source is a really, really interesting idea. Uh, we've seen this in two cases, one on a road project in Costa Rica, where money wants to flow back to the country and fund an important project there, and also in Algeria on an energy project in which the results of the diaspora money would create something very, very new which is about the youth and the notion that these countries need to be planned by younger people, younger than anybody here, okay? That, you know, we- I, I resemble be, that remark. <laughs> we need to facilitate this, but we don't direct this anymore. And the notion is if we can get those, the, some of the upfront stuff that we're talking about when the visions really come true and the money's sitting right there in the pocket, that we need to have the young people. And a lot of it, um, there's been some fantastic ideas, the things that are so out of the box and they start a lot with education funding, how to reduce debt through education and apply it to some of the ways that people want to live. And I'd be happy to talk to you about that another time. Um, finally, the aging population, it's still kind of under the radar there, but every country's dealing with this right now. It's not being solved properly in any city. And uh, my final comment is just even though we're talking about emerging countries, I mean, if I look around the United States, even from 20 years ago, I still am in shock about how in our own country I see the homelessness, uh, you know, cheap and prolific drug use right now going on um, that's addicting kids, homelessness, as I mentioned, uh, child care. These same principles don't think that we're done here. I mean, we're, I'd see, I, I'm more, sometimes more comfortable walking around Shanghai than I am even in many of our cities in Los Angeles or places like that. So this is a, an ongoing problem. We're gonna to have to deal with this, and it's, it's very challenging, but it's, it's extremely, extremely satisfying too when we get results. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, thank you very much. Robin, you're with Embark. Tell us what is Embark, and tell us how it's related to WRI, and also tell us a little bit about this new initiative at WRI. Sure. Uh, I work for Embark, which is the Sustainable Transportation Program within the World Resources Institute, WRI. Recently, we just established a new center. It's called the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. And it builds on the work that we started in transport, but really realizes that even if we want to talk about sustainable transportation, we need to think about cities in urban form and how cities are organized and work together to achieve them. We work, and Bark has been around for 12 years. We've worked, we started in Mexico and then Brazil, expanded to India, China, and Turkey. So we work mainly in developing countries. Uh, and while we started with transport, we have worked within uh, an approach called avoid, shift, and improve. So we talk about avoiding the need to move in motorized transport. We talk about shifting to more sustainable modes of transport, and then improving the existing technologies that exist. I work on urban development and very much the world of avoid, uh, which sometimes makes some of the transportation planners a little bit mad because they're worried, uh, and Embark has traditionally really focused on, especially focused uh, on bus rapid transit. and as is a cost efficient and relatively quick way to solve problems in cities and help structure cities. When we think about transportation sort of going in sort of specifically, we see some of the, the challenges of fitting transport or any of the sectors that we work on uh, into the broader city and how the city works and the kinds of services that people have in those cities. And we've seen a, a lot of failures, uh, maybe not failures, but sort of a lack of success. We've seen cities that really have developed in a very non-sustainable way, in ways that are very distant, that are very dispersed, that are very disconnected. And so we try to emphasize some of the things that have been talked about here earlier today, uh, mixed use and how important it is not to have sort of everybody living over here and everybody working over here and then this need to move them at the same time from one place to the other place all the time. We 
try to move cities towards something that the new climate economy study referred to as connected, compact, and coordinated. So that we talk about an urban form that is more compact, that people and services and opportunities are connected to each other, and that we really have coordination across governments, sort of within a city government, but also between different levels of government. And uh, we see this actually as probably one of the, the big challenges. Sort of, and again, this is nothing new. It picks up on what everyone has said. But this lack of integration, even within the same level of government, is, is a huge challenge as we try to make things happen. If we work with cities to implement and design uh, integrated transport systems, some of the biggest challenges are on the governance side. We can't get, and part of our role is to make sure that different agencies within the same level of government come together for a meeting, but also that there's consistency between the different levels of government. So the folks from, sort of, and that the policies that are being developed at the city level sort of aren't contradictory with the state or provincial level and the federal level or central government. And that is extremely hard. So governance matters, and that's, I'd say, sort of a, a, a big point. We have found that we've needed to talk about public-private partnerships and getting the private sector in, but we've also had to talk about department-to-department -department partnerships and thinking about the public-private partnerships that really revolve around people instead of having the financial aspects really driving everything, really thinking about how you can get what people need and how to structure these services and uh, institutions so that they work for people. One of the great things, and sort of what we see all these, these huge challenges around, is to see the way that we can help bring lessons from some emerging markets to other emerging markets and really promote a lot of South-South learning, um, as well as try to update some of the North-South learning that was there before. Right? When people think about sort of planning, Many of them are stuck in the 50s, 60s, and 70s without capturing some of the newer thinking uh, of, of what's happening in sort of planning schools and in the work that's been done around the world. But there's also a lot of things that have happened in the south, in southern cities themselves that then can be shared. So we've seen things that can be shared. We also realize that there's a lot of more work that needs to be done. Uh, as we've got 80% of the cities that are yet to be built, um, most of those are going to be outside Latin America, but we found a lot of things in Latin America to share. One of those would be bus rapid transit. And so you can go, we now have bus rapid transit that started, depending on which sort of creation story you want to believe, either in Curitiba or in Lima. I tend to think Curitiba was the complete package, uh, is now in 186 cities in the world. And that's something that's not just south-south, but it's also south-north in terms of work that's out there. There are more than 31 million passengers a day that travel on bus rapid transit. And mass transit has to be a part of how of working cities and sustainable cities. A second is thinking about some of the things that came from, from Bogota in terms of ciclovias and car-free days. And now we've helped sort of with Embark uh, export that to India and something called Raghuri Day and Car Free Days that started a year ago in Gurgaon outside of Delhi and now is in over 12 cities in India in the, in the course of a year and another 12 are in the planning. And so we see that there's a hunger for some of these kinds of things that have worked. And one of the things that we do is try to work with other partners, many of whom are sitting here, to, to make those things happen and to find folks in cities in government as well as in the private sector and civil society to make those things work together. Another great idea that came from Brazil uh, is participatory budgeting. You think about something that started in Porto Alegre in 1989 that's now in over 1,500 cities, of getting people involved in a participatory way, not necessarily in the whole budget, in, but in one part of it, so that they feel that the city is theirs. And this comes back to something that, that Dr. Kloss mentioned. Cities change, and there's, there's stuff that needs to be built, and there are new ways of living. But a lot of the approach and the 
way that people feel that they're a part of a city is really key. And participatory budgeting, participatory planning can be part of that. And if people views are not taken into account and they feel that something is imposed, there's often a disincentive to work towards work sort of implementing those kinds of, of projects. I'd say we also have seen things from Latin America that didn't always go as planned, right? And so we can think about in the integrated transport area, the big bang approach that Santiago took when it moved, when it was trying to bring all of its transport systems together. And it really was a disaster, right? It, it, it led to the fall of the government. It, it, it was a huge problem, but they show that you can't just sort of discard things. You've got to continue to improve and work on things. So that now this, the integrated transport system in Santiago is viewed as one of the best in Latin America and a, and a model for the rest of the world. And I think that that does, and, and I'll end on this, that while we think that we've got something that works, we constantly need to improve it. And we've got to incorporate people's ideas into that so that they're part of the answer. And we have cities that really do work for people. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, thank you. Abbas, uh, so I wanted to hear from two different donor perspectives on this. So what are we going to do about all this? There's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of opportunities. I'm sure that you, you, know, you think about this at the World Bank. How's the World Bank thinking about this? Thanks, Dan, and thanks to CSIS for this kind of invitation, and thanks to Dr. Close for his excellent keynote. Um, I wanted to begin by sort of outlining four big issues and one big gap in our understanding of urbanization. So the first big issue is sort of the big trend on GDP. So in living memory, we, we're sort of used to living in an 80-20 world where 20% of countries, the developed countries, generate 80% of the world. That's going to change very fast. If you look out to 2050, about 65% of the world's GDP is going to be generated in Asia and primarily China and India. So that's a big shift. Related to that is that if you, again, project out to 2050, don't hold me accountable for these numbers. It's roughly, I'm, I'm in the ballpark. long run, we'll all be dead, right? <laughs> so. But if you look out to 2050 in terms of per capita income, uh, the developed world, today's developed world, will be around about $90,000 to $100,000 per capita. China and India will be about thirty to $40,000. And Africa will be about two dollars to $3,000. This, these numbers have the potential for great conflict. Uh, if we don't handle this properly. So that's trend number one. Trend number two, big picture, is that, manuf and I think Dr. Close talked about this in his uh, remarks, is that manufacturing seems to be losing steam as a generator of growth. Uh, people like Danny Roderick and Arvind Subramaniam have pointed this out, that countries are moving away from manufacturing at a much earlier stage of development. India is a great example, Philippines is another. Uh, so then what happens? Uh, what, what is going to be the driver of growth in the future? We don't know the answer to that. The third big uh, trend is scale. I think we're tremendously privileged to live in this, the biggest wave of urbanization in human history. Um, just to give you some numbers, in the region I work in, in East Asia, two million people move from rural to urban areas every month. You've heard the expression that Rome wasn't built in a day. Well, China does it in two weeks. So that, just to um, give you some scale. But um, I think we, in the past, we've been guilty, all of us have been guilty of overselling urbanization as a driver of growth. Urbanization doesn't create growth. It creates the room for growth. If managed well, it can be a wondrous thing. Um, no country in the world has gotten to beyond $10,000 per capita without being more than 65% um, urbanized. Um, if you compare countries that are more than 50% urbanized and less than 50%, the infant mortality is a third less. So you know, urbanization is a wondrous thing if managed well. Um, and then the fourth is demographics, and uh, Rick talked about aging populations. That's going to be a big driver of growth. China is perhaps the, um, China is the, biggest, uh, the first country in the world which will grow old before it grows rich. Uh, and that's going to happen more and more. Um, in, in Central Asia and Europe, we're seeing, and in Japan, soon in China, we're going to see this issue of shrinking cities. And this is going to be a big policy challenge for, for uh, city administrators and national uh, level uh, authorities. And in the states, yes. So those were the, my four big uh, trends. Now, in terms of the gaps, and again, Dr. Close talked about this briefly in his uh, keynote, 
One is the big gap is data. We don't even know how to define a, what a city is. We don't have a universal definition. What is a slum? Um, so that's going to be a big challenge. And I'm, uh, it looks like in the post-MDG, the sustainable development goals, we're going to have one on cities. And that might be sort of a good platform to define and get around some of common definitions and a systematic, consistent collection of data. That's going to be really important. The other big gap is urban poverty. We don't know what drives urban poverty. We don't even know how to define it properly. Um, so if a mayor comes to us and asks, I have a dollar at the margin, or $100, or a million dollars, where should I spend it? We, we need to have good answers to that in terms of urban poverty. Now, um, Dan asked me about sort of the donor perspective. And one test that I give to my teams and to myself in anything we do is what I call the mayor of Jakarta test, which is that you should be able to be able to explain to the mayor of Jakarta what you're doing and have not him throw, him, throw you out of the room in five minutes. So that's kind of a litmus test for what we do, the practicality and sort of the explainability of things. And um, I want to talk about three things um, in no particular order. One is housing. Um, many of you may be familiar with the work of uh, Henry Overman, who's a professor at London School of Economics. He runs a wonderful blog called What Works. Uh, and I'd advise uh, anyone to have a look at that blog. And um, I was talking to him last week, and he said that perhaps affordable housing is at the top of the list of things that cities should do to make them work. The thing is that we know broadly the things that you need to do. So I would say reform your subsidies. Most countries have lousy housing subsidy uh, programs. So we know that de demand-side subsidies are better than supply side su subsidies. So that's one. Second is fix your urban land markets. Increase the s supply of service land for affordable housing. Um, the third is cautiously expand your housing finance uh, markets. And then the fourth is uh, expand your rental markets. And rental markets are like a big black hole which we don't know much about. And so those are the sort of the four things that we should do. The problem is we don't know how to do it. Yeah, each country, each context is so local that perhaps each country has to find its own solutions. Uh, whenever I go into a country to talk about affordable housing, the one thing I say is, forget about Singapore and Hong Kong. That's not, a, that's not an example, because they're so sui generis that um, you can't really adapt that to any other uh, context. So that's housing. The other thing is on resilience. Um, Hazem talked about political cycles. The one thing that we talk, uh, the obstacle we face in terms of building resilient cities is what we call NIMTOF, not in my term of office. <laughs> is that why should I invest in, uh, in building, say, resilient schools when I don't know whether it's going to happen in my term of office or not? So that's really a big challenge. Now, in terms of that, we, our job as the World Bank and other donors is to give good empirical evidence in terms of prevention pays. So for example, on hydromet services and early warning systems, we've done studies in Russia, for example, and many other countries, which shows that a dollar invested in early warning systems can save up to $8 later on. This is hardcore cost-benefit analysis, which appeals to ministries of finance. We need more of that kind of uh, work. So that's one, prevention pays. The second is, can anyone tell me what's going to be the biggest driver of disaster losses in the next 50 years? Anyone? It's not going to be climate change. It's going to be the growth of people and assets in harm's way. If you, if you normalize disaster losses, let's say take the US and hurricanes. That's this, the US obviously is the most studied uh, country in the world on this. So if you normalize disaster losses by growth of asset and people, there's no trend. Uh, Despite all the talk about Katrina, Katrina, if you, once you do this exercise, is probably at 9 or 10 in terms of impact. So if there's one message I want to leave with you today, it is that cities need to fix this uh, in terms of better risk-based land use planning, gu guiding the growth of cities away from hazardous areas, because that's really going to be the driver of, of uh, disaster losses. Third point is on prepare for the unexpected. In terms of the disaster community, Sendai and March 11th, 2010 was a wake-up call for all of us. 
Japan is the best prepared country in the world, bar none, in terms of investing in disaster risk management. And yet they saw about 20,000 people die in that. Um, so you need to prepare systems for graceful failure. You need to, when you're designing infrastructure systems, you need to ask, what happens if this fails? Uh, and prepare for uh, graceful failure. And the last is residual risk. I recognize that you're not going to build your way to safety. There will always be some residual risk uh, left and prepare accordingly in terms of investing in early warning systems. And the last point I want to make is uh, something that Robin talked about in the governance, which is something we struggle with on a daily basis. Because of this rapid urbanization, we're seeing these huge urban ag agglomerations at the met metropolitan level. The problem is that very few countries have uh, set up systems to deal with this huge uh, metropolitan level um, governance. And this is going to be a challenge going forward. We have some examples. The problem is, if you look at it 20 years ago, the same examples we are citing today. So Vancouver and Madrid and Barcelona, perhaps. But there aren't too many of those. And often, transport is the entry point for good metropolitan level uh, systems. So I'll leave it there and uh, I look forward to your Thank questions. You. Thank you, Abbas. Charles, how's, how is AID looking at this challenge? You guys have been working on this issue for a long time. I know you came out with a recent report. So tell, what's AID's perspective on this? Okay. Dan, thank you very much for having me, and it's great to be on this distinguished panel and be able to talk about the very important topic for all of us. The, uh, so AID's mission is, is to partner with, with others to eliminate extreme poverty and to build resilient democratic societies. So you can imagine if you're looking at that as a mission that we have to address the urban issues. The, 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 the challenges we, we face are, you know, been well discussed uh, by, by the panelists, uh, but there's also opportunities for us. It, and when you look at a city, you have the opportunity to focus your efforts to bring together multiple sectors, multiple uh, approaches to address uh, these issues in a concentrated geographic uh, location. We've had experience with this, uh, with uh, urban development issues, uh, frankly, going back over 50 years. And from that experience, we've been able to draw significant lessons and experience, not just that we've learned, but also in collaboration with others, such as the World Bank and, and NGO groups and so forth, to figure out what works uh, and how we should focus our efforts. We know, for example, that committed reforms, community participation, and wise infrastructure investments are, can make a significant impact on uh, urban poverty. So we drew on all these lessons and experience and frankly, you know, put out a draft policy to many people, uh, probably many of you here in this room uh, gave us comments on, and we issued this new policy uh, a year ago. And the policy focuses on sustainable country-led urban services. The main focus for us is in talking to our missions around the world and saying, as you're doing your strategic planning, as you're doing your project designs, take into account the urban lens in how you design uh, your programs going forward. We have some missions that are way out in front. Uh, the, our mission in the Philippines, their entire program, their entire strategy is focused on urban centers. centers. Mozambique, they have a significant component of their uh, program is focused on coastal uh, urban centers. And how, what do you do to, with climate change and uh, disaster preparedness? How should they be uh, changing to, to adapt? We also just uh, launched a, in end of September uh, a new mechanism that will support this policy. This is a $650 million uh, ceiling for this contracts for 11 companies that are providing services to all of our missions around the world in supporting uh, improved urban services. Through this mechanism, we will be able to facilitate the process in country. We provide uh, expertise, of course, but we've heard the, the importance of facilitation of collaboration among the local experts and the local uh, stakeholders. And this is a key component of what this uh, new contract, set of contracts will do. It also focuses on governance, everything from accountability, to transparency, to ensure that this is a participatory process uh, as you go forward. 
And then finally, we also working through this mechanism on climate change, adaptation, and disaster preparedness. <clears throat> so this is just one of the tools we have. We have a range of tools uh, working from what are, whether it's uh, climate change programs, water and sanitation programs, uh, governance programs. These all we're trying to bring together to bring to bear on this uh, set of issues. So the, let me give you a couple examples of things that we're currently working on. In India, the, our administrator, Raj, uh, Raj Shah, was just out there, and he signed a, an agreement with the government, government of India that we would work together to address urban water and sanitation issues, that we would work together to identify best practices, to figure out what works, and to share those practices with others around the world, and to look for innovative approaches to how to address these, these serious issues in a country with very large cities that are growing very rapidly. In Dakar, the, the city of Dakar has, is on a uh, path to major revitalization of the downtown uh, of, the, of the city. The first component of that overall plan is the creation of a new marketplace. So the, the city worked with the Gates Foundation to uh, do all the planning involved, a lot of participation with uh, the stakeholders, including the 3,500 uh, street vendors that they're hoping will be brought, brought into this uh, new marketplace. They also had to get their own internal uh, financial house in order in order to be, uh, get a credit rating uh, to go forward with a municipal bond. And this is where we came in. We use our credit guarantee capability to guarantee 50% of that bond. This is a new thing for us. We, we've done some of this in the past, but more recently, this is uh, a new mechanism uh, for us to uh, support cities in uh, getting access to financing. The mayor of Dakar is, uh, is also the president, I guess, of the Association of uh, Municipalities of the all of southern, uh, I guess it's all of Africa, um, and uh, so we're looking to him to help us uh, engage with other cities around the continent that we can help them with this type of approach, these kind of municipal bonds. We can bring these other tools, such as the contracts I mentioned, to help facilitate some of the work that the Gates Foundation worked with them on. So there are opportunities there uh, for us to work together with these municipalities, with other donors, and bringing to bear multiple uh, mechanisms from our side. I'll just end uh, with a kind of a challenge for all of us is to under look at how we can be more innovative. What are new technologies that we can introduce uh, to help with this process? We know there, finally, after many years, GIS technology seemed to be finally taking hold. I've been a great proponent of use of GIS, and I've seen it kind of languish for a long time. More recently now, we see people really looking to GIS uh, as a way to help with planning, to understand issues, to do analysis. But there are also mobile technologies that we also should be looking at. We've been in, um, in uh, when I served in Russia, one of the things we were doing was supporting civil society to engage with uh, citizens and with local government to identify problems in the city. So seeing, finding that pothole, taking that picture, sending it in, getting responsive government uh, so to have citizens more connected directly with their government to respond to their needs. There's another, another project that uh, we worked together, complemented the work of the Gates Foundation in Sekundi Takaradi in Ghana. The Ghanaian government had mandated that all streets need in the country, in the cities of the country, need to be named. Now, many of you, have been, you know, you've been to other uh, many countries in the developing world, and you ask where where is CSIS? Well, it's in the CSIS building, uh, you know, in CSIS house, um, whatever it might be. The, having a street name and a number by that old church around by the old oak tree, exactly. and then you turn left by the rock, and there it is. <laughs> and there it is. So in Secondary Takarati, they took an uh, approach of using GIS to map the city. 
and then give these names and make this data available on the internet. Well, now the city has more capability to know who is where, wh who, where people live, where the businesses are, in terms of planning, but also in terms of revenue generation, uh, taxation, and so forth. It also, by putting it on the web, it gives opportunity for citizens to also apply new innovative technologies, approaches to documenting uh, issues, as well as for businesses to call attention to where they are and to plan where they should locate their businesses. So there is an example uh, that of kind of work that we've been doing and that we'd like to do uh, more going forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Charles. Okay, you all have been very, very patient. I know we've got some microphones here, Jeremiah. Okay, we're going to do this World Bank style, so I'm going to capture four or five questions, and then we'll, uh, and we'll do it that way. I want to hear from my friend, um, who's the dean over at the Tubman School in Liberia, so I want to hear from her first, my friend Ms. Simmons. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was excellent. Um, I'll just... And, I, and I've been in the United States since June, so my 21 days have passed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, um, Dr. Kloss, from what you were saying, it sounds as if there actually does not exist a model currently that uh, countries could use for today because everything seems to be related to the past. So how, how should the developing societies go about finding out the proper way to approach? That was uh, one. I want to say to Mr. Ja uh, and to uh, Mr. North, I would like to see your agencies require before you give funding that the, um, the governance persons have to take your risk management course. I took it online, it's excellent, so I would commend that. And then thirdly, um, in terms of uh, Mr. Abelson, what is authentic uh, brand? Thank you. All right, we're going to capture. We'll capture all these first, and we'll give folks that, that this woman in the back uh, with the with the dark hair and the black sweater. Uh, thank you, reporter from The Voice of America. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Close just mentioned that China is having the biggest process of urbanization in the human history. And also uh, several uh, panelists mentioned that China's problem. So I'm just wondering whether there. Uh, <laughs> panelists can address China's opportunity and problems here. Okay. Thank you. Good. And this gentleman back here who's been standing, so he, Jeremiah, he's back there. He, anybody who's been standing gets extra credit, so. <laughs> uh, I'm John Rothenberg. I'm an Afghanistan specialist. And one of the things that interests me a lot is um, the urbanization and, and radicalization. I've seen some places where where urbanization causes radicalization and other places where it mitigates it. And my question is, is um, what, what's the difference? Good morning. Um, thank you for the, uh, my being here. I don't really have a question, but I will invite all of you. I come from the Philippines. I'm going back home. And Dan Randy and the Southeast Asian chair have been, they don't know that I have been learning from them. And I have been a beneficiary of USAID education. I was sent here both of the government of the Philippines and the government of the United States. The term then was poorest of the poor. And my mayor, didn't believe in development planning. The money that you would spend on master plans, I can build a lot of homes. I saw, but he was a very young mayor, 34 years old. I was very fortunate that he taught me how to maneuver politics, development, and you talk about five C's, I now have eight. I have learned the graceful way to fail. I'm going back to my okay, country. Thank so you. you're all welcome because I'm going there on uh, implementing. I'm creating a think tank that will work with the CSIS okay. because they thought me well. Great. I love Manila. It's a great city. This woman back here. Hi. I'm Lucy Mize, um, USAID Asia Bureau. And my question is, except for Dr. Ja, there wasn't a lot of discussion about economic inequities 
he said we need definitions of urban poverty. And if you look at cities, um, they are not all things to all people. The, some of the people who move in are far worse off than counterparts left behind in the rural sector, particularly if you look at health, which is my area of expertise. And so some of you mentioned governance, which is essential if you're gonna address some of those inequities. Um, I spent the last 18 years in Jakarta and many of the poor don't have access and yet there are world-class hospitals there. So um, I liked the one mention of urban poverty. It's very important. Thank you, and certainly the, the issue of Ebola has, because of urbanization, has taken on a different kind of a, a footprint, right? I think because of the phenomena in urbanization, so very interesting. Okay, so we've got some, a whole series of interesting questions. And so, Hazem, I'm gonna ask you, to, I'm just gonna just go down the panel, then I'll, I'll end with Dr. Close, and I'll give you a chance to have the, have the chance to respond. Hazem, go ahead. Any and all. <laughs> sure. Um, one point specifically about the question about urbanization and radicalization, um, and I'll share with you two examples. Um, there's a national project that's being designed in Egypt right now to develop the region around the Suez Canal corridor. It's one of the most important national projects. And one important fact, in the past, basically, the, the philosophy of development for the Sinai Peninsula, for different reasons, has been to keep the population rather sparse in Sinai. And, and that has created all sorts of security issues that we, 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 we're, we've been watching over TV, you know, with the um, Islamic groups there uh, taking, you know, stronghold and attacking even the army. A, a key driver in the new design of this project is how to create population density in the Sinai because that becomes automatically a, a security buffer against radicalization and, and, and kind of like help you improve security. So that's one example. The extreme side of this, you know, is when you have overly dense, overly, you know, populated and crowded cities that create to inequality and, you know, um, informal settlements, slums, that also creates on the other extreme the, the sort of like the conditions where, you know, because of poverty, lack of access to jobs and, and, and care, uh, it is very easy also to radicalize the youth. And, and you think about what's happening in Europe in some of the poorer cities and their export basically to ISIL and the like. For me, that's, that's a direct result of some of these inequities in cities. Hazem, well, I've got you. I want you to take on this issue of China and I want you to take on this. So what's the right model for say, those are my two bias of, of the question. I liked everybody's question, but those are my two favorites. So yeah. go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, Ch China is, I mean, the rate of population that, you know, and, and urbanization that is happening there is, 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 is mind boggling. And, I, and I, I truly believe that, you know, if we were to develop the new Chinese cities using the old models, basically, that have been used in the West, we are definitely setting ourselves for a lot of problems because you take that coupled with the aging yeah. problem, you know, which is a ticking time bomb in China, and without really thinking about uh, how to do things in a more integrated, more sort of like holistic way, that, you know, I mean, pollution is an issue in a lot of the existing cities. So if we're developing new greenfield cities or expanding existing ones in China, we really need to think about it in a, in, a, in a radical way. And, you know, as I said before, a lot of our urban forms are not designed around human beings. A lot of cities, you know, people converge to the center. Then you have the CBD, which is unused for the CBD? central business district, you know, the downtown area, unused the buildings and the office place is unused for two-thirds of the day, that is not going to work in China for sure. Okay, how about just in, in, I think where my friend is going is in the case of Africa, what's the, what's the, what, talk about right models for African cities, given some of the comments that were made here, as well as some of Dr. Close's comment that South Africa is developing, urbanizing without having manufacturing. Just, just, 
just a little bit of on that. Reflect on that. Um, the, the, the main issue there is you basically how do you create economic growth and jobs and, and skill the population that is migrating from the rural areas to the urban areas and, and, and try to, if, if you're unable to reverse that migration by creating sustainable economic activities in rural areas, then how you upskill that population in, as they are immer, you know, migrating to the cities and, and a lot of, it's what I call the Maslow hierarchy for cities, right? You know, I mean, it's, and, and I think in the donor worlds, you know, which, which I have been part of with UNDP for some point of time, sometimes we forget about that, that, you know, the, the needs really vary. If you're looking at the bottom of the pyramid, it's more about sanitation, it's more about basic infrastructure, but we really need to think about it so that we're also incorporating the other needs and, and not losing that balance. Okay. Rick, um, microphone. We don't use these in California. Right. <laughs> 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 um, you know, uh, overall, I think that one of the differentiators about the company I work with, CH2M Hill, is that we run cities. I mean, that's pretty unusual that not only can you plan it, but we actually put people on the ground and we do everything for a city. We do it for actually seven U.S. cities. We don't do emergency services, but we're the planning department, we're the transportation department, we pick up the garbage. Um, you know, so uh, when you can get from you know, the A all the way down to the Z on, on that, um, it really makes it a lot more realistic about some of the things that you can do. Now, uh, that model we're starting to take globally, and particularly in India, where the DMIC corridor is uh, between Delhi uh, and Mumbai, where they're developing uh, a series of new cities, the bids uh, packages that are going out are about much more than just planning and land use. They're much more about governance and creation of the governments, governance, and then staying in there and figuring out how to keep these, these cities vibrant and what the brand image should be on those and how can they be different from each other. Um, and uh, you asked about uh, on the, uh, what's an authentic brand. I mean, there are, I've worked quite a bit actually uh, creating some of the brand identity for Auckland and New Zealand in, in the early 2000s. And, and you, there are intrinsic qualities that you can pull out of a, a very warring society that's isolated on an island. And you really can, there are those intrinsic pieces, but then there are a lot of the aspirational pieces. And then there's just the day-to-day -day life pieces. And so cracking what I'll call the DNA of the city to get to what are the most important ones. ones are the, what are the ones that are gonna affect daily life and are gonna be able to make change, be able to create and maintain the pride that people have and foster growth are really how you create the authentic brand. It takes some time, you gotta get the right people in the room, it takes lots of perspective and it's always being challenged and has to be, remain flexible in a way. Could you just talk, just, I wanna just push you on this issue of China, could you just reflect on China? Uh, I've worked quite a bit in China. I, I was uh, mostly started in uh, about 1994, but quite a bit in China beginning in 2000, particularly Shanghai, Beijing, some of the second tier cities. So I've watched quite a bit of China grow. I have many, many friends there. I understand how the society works there. Uh, I was fascinated to watch how everything happened. Um, I agree that there's a big change in China now, trying to figure out what to do next. I mean, Olympics went by, World's Fair went by. I've been to Dongtan Island, I see all the great things that they've done, and I really do believe that China's trying to figure out, you know, the next big move, but uh, right now uh, there seems to be quite a bit of prosperity in the big cities. There's a calmness that I feel there. Um, uh, as In the second cities, there's been tr quite a bit of development on building up the airports and you know, getting some of the key infrastructure done while the elected officials are in office. I forget the term that you asked. Right. <laughs> um, but there, there's been a big drive on sustainability and what this Not in my term of office, I'm gonna take that NIMTO. Nim, nim the, the, the key question I get by Chinese government officials particularly is, we like that idea, we understand that idea. Show us how to do it. We're here to listen, show us it. And so this notion that I mentioned at the beginning where we go in and actually stay involved all the way to implementation is really what's needed. And I think the funds that you know, are available um, help support that and the governments will help support that but these are very tough concepts you know and and, and so you just got to stick with it and uh, keep going. Sorry. Robin. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the issue on equity because I do think that it's very important uh, and it is the 
I would say sort of a, a huge gap that we have is even in places where we've got models that seem to work sort of at a, at a small scale. If you think about transit-oriented development areas that are mixed use, that are walkable, that are around transit, that uh, can be participatory, that oftentimes that success, because of the way that land markets work, lead to the poor being pushed out of, of the areas of success, which leads to some of that alienation and radicalization in different ways. And so that, to me, is, is probably the biggest gap that we need to figure out. And I think that we can come up with interesting financing ways, if you think about land value capture and things like that, to, to fund some of those things, but to make it affordable so that the poor can benefit from that really is one of the great unsolved mysteries in this space that I think we all need to work together. I think rental housing markets or rental housing is a, and is part of that, but we've got to think about it for all different aspects so that the poor do have access to all of those cities or all of those services because if they don't, cities will be time bombs. Just by concentrating folks together, uh, and not providing opportunities for, for all kinds of economic opportunity as well as access to those services. Okay, Abbas and Charles, if you guys keep it short, and then we give the last word to Dr. Close. Okay, um, very quickly. So urban China, um, I think there is no more important question in the development world than how, how is China going to deal with urbanization? Because if they don't get it right, I mean, we're doomed as a planet. It's no exaggeration. But that said, I must say that China is doing a lot of things right. So if you took, took, talk about, say, public transport, uh, China has more metro lines than the rest of the world put together. They, if you took the top five BRTs, the bus rapid transits, three of them, I think, are in China, including the biggest. If you look at fuel efficiency of cars, they are above the Europe, European standards. So they are doing a lot of things right. But that said, um, they are, there is room for improvement. So for, I would pick two things. I would say urban land markets, so more dense, more mixed-use, walkable, uh, form of, uh, of urban planning, I think, is really important, and fixing the municipal finance systems so that they are less reliant on land sales and land uh, leases. And uh, there, uh, the World Bank just brought out a report called Urban China. If you Google it, you'll find it easily. I think it's a very good report. I'm not pitching our own work, but it is a very good report, and I advise everyone to have a look at it. In terms of urban poverty and inequity, I think Robin's points are well taken. Um, the other thing I would emphasize is social safety nets for urban areas. You know, conditional cash transfers have got a lot of play. We know how to do it in rural areas. In urban areas, not so well. So I think that would be the next big thing. Um, to your question about risk-based planning, I was in a meeting with the mayor of Ulaanbaatar about a month ago, and I think he put it beautifully, and I'll just repeat what he said to us. He said, I need to make my urban planners and architects think like economists, and I need to make my economists think like urban planners. And that's really the challenge. Charles? <clears throat> so a few uh, quick things. One, uh, great to see a participant of our uh, uh, training programs uh, here and wish you the best of luck going back to the Philippines and uh, leading uh, development there. So, so good luck to you. The uh, second, uh, on Afghanistan, uh, the, I think we have a lot to learn from our experience uh, in Afghanistan. I remember we, you know, when we, you know, the issue of stabilization in Kandahar, uh, and the first, uh, the effort was, okay, well, clearly everybody needs access to a well. I'm making this up, but, it, it, you know, so we ran and, and put a lot of wells in it. It didn't seem to do much good. Uh, with, we got a bit more sophisticated, and we started saying, well, if you actually look at the city, you start dividing it by neighborhood, you start looking at and, and actually going out and talking to the people and ask them what they really need uh, and what is their priority list of, what, of requirements, and you start to address those needs. One part of the city, it may be wa access to water. Another part, it may be somebody to pick up the trash. Uh, and, you know, this is, seems very simple. Uh, but it is something that we ought to be taking back to everywhere we work. How do you engage citizens uh, across the, the city uh, to understand what their real needs are and whether their needs are being met? And that will get at a lot of the, those kinds of issues. And finally, just, I uh, just want to say, uh, in, the, in the spirit of, of partnership and, uh, and learning from each other, 
I'm looking forward to seeing this course uh, and uh, look, uh, see, make sure uh, our staff are uh, aware of it and, and taking a full advantage of the World Bank has already done. So with that, thank you. Dr. Close, you get the last word. Thank you very much. I would like first to refer to the question about the future, uh, because uh, it seems that I've been blamed because I talk too much about the past. <laughs> but I want to talk also about the future. Uh, in this part of the developing world where most of the things are happening in terms of urbanization, we are advising for uh, two strategies, one at central level and another at local level. At central level, we are proposing for a national urban policy. Funny enough, many countries, they have a lot of national policies. They have environmental policy, housing policy, defense policy, I don't know, name it. But there are only 20 countries in the world that they have urban policy. And uh, we have studied the 20 that have uh, urban policy. And the, most of them, they are not really urban policies. Uh, what urban policy is, is just to answer one question. Uh, where is your population today? Where do you think that your population is going to be in 20 years? And what is the government going to do about it? This is the only question that a national urban policy uh, needs to, to answer. Then the second question that we advocate is uh, to uh, do at local level uh, urban design, uh, planet urban design, well structured planet urban design in order to plan for two things, planet city extensions and infields. Then when we think about planet urban design, we are not thinking on master planning, which has been the traditional uh, Western approach. We, we advocate for what we call the three-legged approach. And the three-legged approach is not just the architect are the, and the economist. No, we put a team which is with three uh, legs. And one is the lawyer, the other is the architect, and the other is the economist. Because in urbanization, rules and regulations is something that usually is forgotten and is the most important and the founding principles of urbanization. Hmm? Uh, then there's not enough with, the, of course, the physical design of the space. You need a financial design because, you know, without a financial design, you cannot finance anything, but that, there's enough, that there is enough. If you don't have a good normative approach to urbanization, the problem is that nobody, fol nobody follows the rule. Usually the first who doesn't follow the rules is the ruler, and then what becomes is an, a kind of ungoverning uh, reality. Urbanization, it's about the rule of law. Uh, you, we cannot perform, we cannot reach good urbanization without the rule of law. And that should be understood very well because otherwise this is m where more, most of the things uh, fail. Let me, this is the strategy for the future that we are advocating and we are practicing for, with many countries in a small experiments you know, because there's a, a paradigm shift as you see. It's a very difficult, we don't trust on, 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 on reports and uh, advisory. We, we put our teams in situ, and usually for two years, because uh, building a proper city is more a political issue than a technical issue, okay? Then l let's go to China. China is a very interesting, uh, for us is a very interesting case, because China, uh, Deng Xiaoping chose urbanization as his strategy. When 30 years ago he began the opening of the economy, the first thing th that uh, he did was to create the five special zones. They were called five, five special zones, but in fact they were five cities, being the first nearby Hong Kong, the Shenzhen uh, city. Shenzhen, uh, city. Then, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, was a very clever chap because he decided that the way to take out of China, out of poverty, was through urbanization. And no, if you see, uh, urbanization of China is the huge success of manufacturing in China. The transformation of China has been an urbanization-led transformation. 
the problem of China urbanization is not its productivity, which is huge. The problem of Chinese urbanization, as somebody has said here in the table, is that the design that they have chosen is not the best, and it can be easily improved. It serves very well the purpose of development, it doesn't serve well other purposes of urbanization, because urbanization is not only development. Urbanization is about generating a new culture, urbanization is about, uh, I don't know, happiness, uh, you can main, name it. Eh? Then uh, the, 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 the very interesting uh, Chinese uh, experiment that a good de doctoral thesis should compare the Japanese urbanization, the Korean urbanization, and the Chinese uh, urbanization in order to see in this uh, very short period of, of, of time, very, di very in, in a way, different and, and, and similar models of urbanization with their uh, outcomes. On relation to... La last one. Yeah, please. Uh, does urbanization generate uh, crisis or, or, uh, or, or it helps to diminish the conflict? Urbanization is, in that sense, neutral. It's not urbanization who is going to solve the conflict or is going to create the conflict. It's the political model under which the urbanization is taking place. Don't blame the layout of the streets and the layout of the buildable plots. Uh, I say, I'm saying that because Afghanistan is our biggest program. Uh, we are in 63 countries in the world, and we have more than 500 people in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, you cannot... Urban planners, they are not gods. They cannot solve all the problems of society. If you have a corrupt society, don't don't pretend that through urban planning you will solve the problems of corruption. Or if you have a tribal society, don't think that through urbanization, and this refers also to the other question of inequality. Inequality, uh, excuse me, in the United States, but in the rest of the world, inequality is not something that is supposed to be solved by cities. Inequality is supposed to be addressed by redistribution policies. And mainly, in everywhere, the redistribution policies in a society, they are not governed by uh, local governments. In very few countries, the redistribution policies are governed by local policies. Then, you, you can have, for example, Rio de Janeiro. It's a very good example. What improves the situation of Rio de Janeiro, it has been not his urbanization because the, city, the streets and buildings have not changed. What has changed has been the redistribution policy. La mia vida, mia casa, more money to certain uh, strata of uh, the population, etc. And that has appeased some of the conflicts in the, in the favelas. Uh, and this is not because the favela has improved in its urbanization. The favela, they are as orful, orful as always. Uh, then, don't pretend to solve the problems of inequality through urbanization. Urbanization serves for certain purposes which is generate economies of agglomeration if it's well done, uh, facilitate the good transit of the city, uh, the good conviviality of the people if the housing is, etc. But even the best urban planning in an unjust society is not going to produce a just uh, 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 ivory tower isolated of the rest of the country. Then there's an intimate uh, linkages between uh, the effects of central government policies uh, in the urban outcomes. You cannot have a, a group of, uh, you know, uh, unwise people in the central government and a, a wise mayor and think that because there's a wise mayor, he will address all the problems of the government. No. And, for example, the security policy, safety, this is, in most of the ca uh, cases, in most of the countries of the world, it's a central policy. It's not a local policy in its sense. 
the mayor can do a little bit more or less. But you know, uh, you know, if you have a, a, a if you have a national security system which is in failure, don't hope that even if you had a well, if you have a good planned city, you will have there a perfect security. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very Thank much, you very Dr. Gross. Please join me in thanking the panel.